I can't talk. Woo! Yeah. And what, what better way to start than with uh, Jessica McKellar. She's a, a, a PSF board member and an organizer at uh, the Python uh, Boston uh, user group. Uh, and her talk is it's called The Internet. So give Jessica a warm welcome. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so I'm here today to talk to you about my favorite topic in the whole wide world, which is the internet. And I will say that the actual point of this talk is for me to convey to you how fun I think networking is, but uh, let's, let's at least say that this is the question we're trying to answer. So here's the question that I would like us all to be able to answer today. You're on, you know, you're at home, you pull up Firefox, you type http colon slash slash python.org into your browser bar and you press enter. What actually happens at a networking level to get the Python homepage displayed on your screen? And this is actually several questions rolled into one. So one question is, what is python.org? You know, conceptually or physically or whatever, what is it? And where is python.org out in this wide universe? Uh, how does my computer talk to python.org? And once it's talking, what does it actually say? We're going to talk a lot about a lot of specific popular internet protocols during this talk. And a protocol is just a format and rules for exchanging information. Um, in particular, uh, on the internet, protocols are layered. So you have one protocol per task, and they all work together to get useful work done. So our first question was, what is python.org? Uh, and there's a protocol called the Domain Name Service, or DNS, uh, whose whole job is to answer that question. It translates host names, like python.org, to IP addresses. Uh, just numbers, unique numbers, out on the internet that uniquely identify machines that are easy for computers to talk about. So in this case, uh, python.org's IP address is 82.94.164.162. And we could do that lookup using the DNS service. And so this literally happens when you, are, you know, when you are browsing the web and you go to a new website. Uh, the first thing that happens is that your machine makes a request to a DNS resolver uh, whose job is to do that lookup, to figure out what IP address python.org actually points to. And it will do that query, figure some stuff out on the internet, and report back to your machine so that you can then use that IP address in, in, in subsequent internet communication. So that was our first question. That was the what. The next question was where. Where is python.org? And there's a protocol that's all about this topic as well. And that protocol is the internet protocol. And the internet protocol's job is to handle addressing and routing throughout the internet. So um, I do my DNS resolution, and I get an IP address. That IP from IP address is the same IP from internet protocol. And then the IP protocol's job is to figure out how to get from point A to point B. So I'm at home. I happen to live in Boston. So I was at home in Boston, and I wanted to talk to python.org. How do I get from Boston to wherever it is that python.org lives? Like the physical hardware that is hosting the python.org web service. How do I eventually get there? And the IP protocol is responsible for figuring this out. And it uses those IP addresses um, to figure out hop to hop to hop through computers on the internet, through routers on the internet, uh, which path to take. And we can actually look at this in a really fun, interactive way using Python, using a library called Scapy. Uh, so Scapy lets you um, sort of interactively uh, manipulate uh, packet information. So you can start Scapy, and it has an interactive prompt, just like an interactive Python prompt. And what you can do is use a built-in traceroute function in Scapy to uh, look up hop by hop, router by router, the IP addresses that your machine connects to to get from point A to point B, to get from my home in Boston to python.org. And that's very fast, so why don't we break it down a little bit? So here I've, I've added a little bit of metadata on this. On the left is the IP addresses. At the very top is me at home in Boston. At the very bottom is the machine, the IP address, the physical hardware hosting python.org. And we see a bunch of steps. You know, I don't have a direct line to python.org. I have to go through a bunch of intermediary machines on the internet to get from point A to point B. And if you look on the left, you see the IP addresses. And you look on the right, you see the host names. And that is that exact mapping, that DNS mapping from host names to IP addresses that we saw earlier. Another cool thing that you can do with Scapy is you can, do a, you can visualize this path through the internet. So I went ahead and at the bottom uh, generated a graph from this data. 
And here's a zoomed out version of the graph. There's me at the top, there's Python at the bottom, and you see circles. And each circle is for a distinct IP address that we went through, and they're grouped into colors. And each color is a different company managing the IP addresses and the physical hardware behind those hops to the internet. So what we can see in this big picture is that there are many companies working together to get my packets from Boston to python.org. And we can even drill down on this a little bit. So I'm at home and I talk to Comcast, various parts of Comcast. I talk to Cogent, another internet service provider. I talk to IS and then you know, hop by hop by hop by hop, IP address by IP address, until I finally get to the end, to the provider of python.org. We can do even more with those IP addresses, those traceroute IP addresses from Scapy. Um, one cool thing that we can do is we can geolocate them. So we can use a service um, that has gathered a bunch of data to figure out where, at least approximately, IP addresses are. And we can um, get a sense of where physically my, my packets, the data that I send, are actually going through the internet. So here are those same IP addresses from Scapy. And I used, um, there, there, there are many free and paid services that will let you do this, but here is one that had um, a very nice, simple uh, Python bindings for their service. And what I'm doing here is for every trace route IP address, I'm doing a, a, a lookup, like you know, a geolocation lookup on where approximately that, the hardware for that IP address lives. And this is the result. And I think that's really cool. So I don't know if you had a guess for where python.org might live physically in the universe, but as it turns out, it lives in Amsterdam. And my packets, so every time I visit python.org, there are packets that start out, data that starts out on my machine in Boston, goes along, like, you know, physical wires, goes along wires between Boston and New York, hops around physical hardware, computer to computer, Boston to New York, crosses the Atlantic somehow, we'll see that in a bit, crosses the Atlantic, gets to London, and from there makes its way to Amsterdam, and then back again for the data that I get back from the server. I mean, that's an amazing amount of hardware and software and political engineering to make this happen reliably all the time without us even thinking about it. And I think that's really cool. And you know, what about that Atlantic Ocean? I mean, it's worth spending two seconds reflecting on the fact that companies literally laid giant cables under the Atlantic Ocean that our, our telephone conversations and our internet conversations go through. They, they physically, the zeros and ones, go through along these cables to get from New York to London so that we can talk to Europe. <coughs> I think that's just spectacular, so I think that's really cool. Okay, so that was a little bit roundabout, but we were answering the question, where is python.org? And we know very well now uh, where it is. It's in Amsterdam, and we can get from point A to point B. We can get from Boston to Amsterdam using uh, data from this internet protocol. Okay, so we've answered two questions. Question number three was, how does my computer talk to python.org? And we have a protocol for this as well. We use the transmission control protocol to talk reliably. TCP's whole job is to reliably deliver data from point A to point B on the internet. And what do I mean by reliable? Um, well, it's, as we've seen, it's a, it's a complicated path to get from me to python.org. And things usually work, but sometimes they don't. A couple of things can happen. Uh, one thing that can happen is that um, the individual computers, the individual routers that I'm going through hop by hop, sometimes they get full. Like, I have too many packets to keep track of, I can't get any more. And they will drop incoming packets on the ground. So sometimes packets get dropped, or they get lost, or you know, you're sitting next to a microwave that's really strong, and it messes with the Wi-Fi signal. Lots of funny things can happen to corrupt or otherwise uh, cause packets to not actually get from source to destination. But we don't have to worry about that, because this TCP protocol's whole job is to uh, take care of that. And it will retransmit data that gets dropped, and will do a couple of nice things to ensure that you have a nice steady stream of reliable packets getting from A to B. And this idea of a reliable connection is so useful that, in fact, much of what we use the internet for uses this TCP uh, transport protocol um, to do more fancy things on top of. So whenever you browse the web, when you use a chat service, when you check your mail, all of these things are using this TCP reliable transport under the hood to ensure that you don't have to worry about your packets getting dropped. This does mean something interesting, though. So this means that you can have a server, like python.org, out on the internet, 
And it potentially um, is using TCP for many applications at the same time. Like python.org might know how to talk about web requests, but it might also be a chat service, and it might also be a way to check your mail. And they all use TCP. So the way that we disambiguate different TCP streams for different applications is that there's a port associated with the application layer protocol that you're using. So you use different ports for different applications so that you can use TCP for all of them together on the same machine, and your operating system can disambiguate them. The networking stack in your computer can disambiguate them. So that is what a port is for, and we'll see ports more in a bit. OK, so TCP, reliable data delivery. It's a pretty good idea. Question number four. OK, we have a reliable channel for communication. What does my computer actually say to python.org? And we have a protocol for that as well. This one may look familiar. This is the hypertext transfer protocol, which is what clients use to make requests for resources from servers. So when I'm on Firefox, I type python.org and I hit enter, my client machine, my laptop, is requesting resources from that destination server. And so when you, you, know, when you, when you type that HTTP colon slash slash, that's what that HTTP is for. That is the HTTP protocol describing what that communication looks like. Uh, and you request resources, which can be pretty much anything, but I think we often see resources that are HTML web pages, that are images, that are dynamically generated content. Like if you visit whattimeisit.com, it spits back out the current time. And it's dynamically generating response to that request for a resource. So those are resources, and that's HTTP. One of the really cool things about HTTP is that it is, um, it's just a plain text, line delimited, a very human readable protocol. So if we wanted to, we could fake being our own web browser pretty easily. Um, there's a tool called Telnet that we can use to do exactly the same functionality that our browsers do under the hood. So let's see what that looks like. And Telnet, I mean, you probably have it installed on your machine right now. You could go do this right now if you wanted. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, Telnet, I would like to make a connection to python.org on port 80. 80 is the web, the HTTP port. Once I've established that TCP reliable connection, I'm going to use the HTTP protocol to get or request a particular resource. In this case, forward slash, just the root, the, the, the default resource, the root resource you get when you visit python.org. And it spits back out a bunch of text. And we can drill down on what it actually retrieved. So this was the request, telnet to python.org on port 80. And we see a, a DNS lookup happening under the hood, right? We're mapping that python.org IP, that python.org uh, host name to an IP address. And we use that host name to establish our TCP connection. Once we've done that, we use the HTTP protocol to get or request a resource for that particular host. And then this is what we get back. So we're talking the HTTP protocol. The first thing we get back is a status code saying, I got your request, I understood it, everything is great, 200 OK. We get a bunch of headers, just extra data about the request. Uh, the date, some information about the server, uh, when it was last changed, and the content type. In this case, we're going to be, uh, the request we were, uh, the resource we requested uh, is going to be an HTML page. And then after that, we have the body of the request, the HTML that makes up the thing that your browser renders to look nice when you look at it in, in Firefox or in Chrome. And so if, if you've ever used um, a Python library like urllib or pycurl or requests, and you, you know, suck down HTML pages from, from uh, far away, uh, this is what's going on under the hood. urllib is making an HTTP get request for uh, resources uh, on a, at a particular domain. And it's no accident that the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, shares part of its name with the hypertext markup language, HTML. This protocol and this format are, are, you know, have a long coupled history with each other. And if you want to learn more about uh, you know, programmatically scraping and manipulating web content, the talk right after this in this room is all about doing that with a Python library called Scrapey. So check it out. Okay, so being a web client is super easy using Telnet. How about being a web server? This is also really easy, as it turns out, in Python. Um, there are a lot of ways that you could do this, but uh, a way that I like to do it is using a library called Twisted. And Twisted makes it very easy to build clients and servers for a variety of networking protocols. And this is 
95% of, of an actual web server that you could run that would be able to listen to and respond to HTTP requests. It wouldn't respond very interestingly. All it knows how to do is echo back what you asked it, but you could absolutely run this out on a server on the internet and clients could connect to it and get data back. And let's break down sort of the, the high level interesting points of this. So the first thing we see is that we're implementing a class that talks HTTP, that talks the HTTP protocol. It receives lines from a client and it responds with lines when you request a resource. The first line that it sends out is a status code, that HTTP 200 OK that we saw earlier. Toward the bottom, we see that we are listening for TCP connections on port 80. So TCP is that reliable transport that we use that HTTP sits on top of, and 80 is the port that is the conventional port used for HTTP traffic. So it's all coming together. And then at the very bottom, uh, reactor.run just says, do this in a loop. So I want you to just sit here listening on port 80 for TCP connections indefinitely and respond to them. And that is, in a nutshell, what real web servers do. When you visit python.org, when you visit google.com, and you do all of that stuff, this is the essence of what is happening under the hood to respond to your requests. And I think it's, I don't know, I think it's amazing that in Python you can express this in like one slide. That's just super cool. Okay, so that is what my computer says when it's talking to python.org. We use the HTTP protocol to request resources from servers. So we've answered our four questions. We pretty much know the answer to this question. We know the full story at this point. So the first thing we do is we do a DNS request to translate a host name to an IP address. At the very bottom, the bottom layer, we're using IP to handle addressing and routing through the internet. On top of that, we have uh, the TCP protocol for reliable delivery. And uh, at the application level, we are using HTTP to request resources from servers. And that is our story. So I think that's very fun, uh, and it, uh, I, uh, I explore uh, protocols in my free time all the time. Like on Saturday mornings, I'll sit with my coffee, and I'll sit on my laptop, and I want to learn more about uh, how the internet works. Uh, and there are tools that make it very easy to do this. Um, another one is called Wireshark. And Wireshark's deal is uh, you can use this tool on your machine, and you can say, hey, computer, um, even though you don't normally, I want you to just keep your ears open and listen for and report back to me all of the traffic, all of the networking traffic that you can hear so that I can look at it. So this is what uh, using Wireshark to capture and listen to and analyze network traffic looks like. And I ran this at home. Uh, and I'm saying, OK, Wireshark, set up my computer to listen to network traffic. And we see just tons and tons and tons of data scrolling across the screen. I let this run for five minutes, and I ended up capturing around 10,000 packets from a variety of networking protocols. And this is all just me hanging out with my laptop and a couple of other machines at home. So a ton of traffic is happening. And we can even drill in on some of that traffic. So we can see some familiar faces from earlier in the talk. In that Wireshark dump, there are examples of me surfing the web. So we see my source IP address the destination IP address of a server out on the internet. And I, uh, in this case, I was visiting the web page for Boston Python's, uh, the Boston Python user group. And we see at the top, making a DNS request, looking up the host name, looking up the IP address for that host name. We see establishing a TCP connection. We see making an HTTP request and getting the response back. And, so, and you can see all of this happen sort of in real time using this Wireshark utility. You can see other things that you might not expect. So one thing that I saw when I was doing this is that I have a printer. And the printer is on my local network, and it is so, so lonely. Um, and it uh, periodically generates uh, you know, network traffic saying, hi, everyone, I'm a printer. I would really love if somebody wanted to print to me. <laughs> I also saw that I have lonely TiVos. Uh, maybe the TiVo should get together with the printer. I don't know. Anyway, so they're all sitting chatting um, on this local network, and you would never know that this is happening under the hood uh, unless you sort of took the time to go look at it. I think this is pretty fun. I also see errors. So I saw. So you, uh, this is an example of TCP retransmitting packets due to packet errors, packet loss, packet corruption. So that TCP reliable transport is totally doing its job under the hood, even at home. 
Um, you can see um, handshakes happening for encrypted communication. So there are protocols that will transform your data before, um, well, that will transform your data so that people who, like me, who are uh, snooping in on your conversations uh, can't read it. And you can see the whole client and server handshake setting up that encrypted channel in Wireshark. Speaking of encrypted communication, does anyone here use IRC? Some people are on IRC right now, maybe. Guess what's not an encrypted uh, protocol? <laughs> IRC is not, <laughs> in case you're wondering. So uh, here is an example of me uh, logging into an IRC service um, and joining some rooms and talking. So here's sort of the high-level overview of that. And then we can drill down on this a little bit. Uh, so here is the IRC service prompting me for a password. <laughs> Uh, and you can see it. And it, you know, this is IRC is, again, it's a, it's a plain text, line delimited protocol. You could write a twisted client or server for IRC as well. And then here's me responding with my password, Django for life, on this IRC on Freenode for this, uh, so, so I can join some, some of my favorite open source cha channels. So if anyone is currently on IRC right now in this room, um, it's just something to think about. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so. Okay, so Wireshark is very cool. It's a very fun utility for exploring, for learning more. You should never do it um, in a malicious or bad way. You should only do this on your own traffic at home. But it's a very cool tool, so I would totally recommend spending a Saturday morning uh, seeing what your TiVo and your printers are saying. Okay, I have one final demo for you. Um, this is, again, just, this is totally gratuitous, just because I think the networking is so fun. Okay, so... I have, I'm not married, <laughs> but if I um, ever needed to propose to someone, um, this is a way that I would consider uh, doing it. So, um, hearkening back to the lonely printers from earlier, um, in this output we saw, uh, there, there are some new protocols that we haven't talked about before. One of them is the address resolution protocol, or ARP. And ARP is a protocol that you use locally, on your local network, to map hardware addresses to IP addresses. And by hardware address, I mean there's like a, you know, there's a physical device, there's like a physical card that handles the actual physical sending out zeros and ones out, out into the internet. So there's a physical card that has its own um, unique address that is distinct from the IP address that is used for routing. And the address resolution protocol is used to map those hardware addresses to IP addresses on your local network so that machines in your local network know how to talk to each other. So that like my TiVo knows how to talk to my machine locally, for example. I mean, the most important thing that ARP is probably used for is that uh, on your local network, you can all talk around, but um, there's typically one machine, a gateway router, or your, maybe your access point, your gateway router, that is used, that is, the, that is the machine that all of your traffic that's going to go out to the internet uses. So, you know, when I generate traffic locally, or when I, when I visit um, a website, all of my traffic goes through this gateway router to get out to the internet. So the gateway router is very important. Um, and so the way that uh, machines on your local network know where the gateway router is is by using this ARP protocol to, uh, to say who is who. So you'll say, you know, who is the gateway router? Who is 192.168.1.1? And the router will respond with, oh, it's me. Um, and so one of the funny things about this protocol is that it's sort of trust-based. It assumes that you're not going to lie about who you actually are. But you can lie about who you actually are. So what I'm doing in this demo here is I'm setting up a machine on my local network to do a couple of things. Well, number one, it's running a web server. So it's able to serve content uh, when someone makes HTTP requests. Number two, I'm setting it up to know how to handle traffic for uh, my gateway router at home, for the machine that has 192.168.1.1, the gateway router through which all traffic goes out to the internet. The next thing that I'm doing is I'm starting Scapy. And I'm going to create some ARP packets um, that are going to uh, gratuitously, uh, without really being requested, that are going to say, hey, you know who the gateway router is? It's me. It's me with my custom web server that is set up to serve my own content, regardless of what website you are actually trying to visit. Your traffic does not go out to the internet. It actually goes to me. So I'm sending out these packets telling all of the other machines that I am the gateway router, and then I'm going to go, my hapless boyfriend, doing some work, checking out some Python documentation, tries to visit python.org, and this is what he gets. <laughs> so. so 
So now, like I said, I haven't actually done this yet, but it is awfully tempting, so I keep this in my back pocket for if the situation ever arises. Okay, I'm just about out of time. Hopefully, I have sufficiently motivated you to go check out some of these really phenomenal libraries for um, learning about and manipulating network traffic in Python. Twisted is a great library for doing a lot of this stuff, um, and I love Twisted so much that I actually wrote a book about it. <laughs> uh, and if you want to talk to me about that book or even get a free copy of the book, um, I will be in the expo hall tomorrow afternoon at 3.30 um, with the O'Reilly booth, and we can talk about Twisted and how great networking is. Uh, there's that Scapey interactive packet manipulation software. There's Wireshark. There are a ton of really great libraries. Python is a great language for learning more about this stuff. That's my pitch to you. I hope you will go home uh, from PyCon, go back to your hotel room, and check out some of the stuff. Maybe sniff your own wireless traffic. Um, and that's all I have, so I'm done. That's it. This is the whole internet. The entire internet. You want to take questions? Yeah, of course. How long do I have? Do I even have time? So yeah, we have awesome. four minutes. Great. So we're going to take questions. Uh, if you please, we'll walk up to the mic that's right in the in the in the middle. Um, so the if, since we're recording this, so that people can hear your question, uh, and then so we have four minutes. <coughs> Hi, Jessica. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Jessica, for a good talk. I just want to uh, know that uh, will you be making the slides available so that we can replay what you did uh, in terms of uh, capturing the and you know fooling the gateway to for our resolution and all that. Can, can, can we read? the question, will the slides be up or? Yeah. Can, yes, so the slides so, will all be up on speaker deck for all of the PyCon talks. So, so they'll be up. Uh, so, we, so we'll be able to recreate what you did here, right? You'll have to change some details around, but yeah, the essence of it is there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Lonely printer. <laughs> yeah, you can just, just line behind her if you have questions. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. I listened to Security Now, and they do a lot of um, background information of what you just talked about in terms of networking. I'm always paranoid about security. So using this knowledge, how are we able to obscure our address so other people do not, cannot identify us. Okay, so the answer to that is sort of long and complicated, but there are a couple of things. So one is that, um, so HTTP traffic, like IRC traffic, is also unencrypted. And you should always use uh, the uh, encrypted version of HTTP when possible, so HTTPS. And you can Google around for what that is and why that's important. Um, if you're actually interested in anonymizing who you are, um, there are various services that do this, like Tor, that has you know, is sort of well audited and, and has well understood properties for what it does and doesn't guarantee you. Um, but that's a very big topic, so we can talk about it more afterwards if you want. Thank you very much for the good talk. Now that we all have Raspberry Pis, what are some of your thoughts about cool networking stuff to do with a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, geez, I mean, so many things. I mean, the, the, the great first thing is like set up your own web server if you've never done it before, and really get into the nitty gritty of what it, of what that means to serve content to have, you know run your own website. It's super educational, I mean, yeah. And it gives you, you know, networking is fun, it's also important. This is like a basic computer literacy thing because networking, the internet, it comes up in current events all the time, right? Uh, and it's good to know how this stuff actually works when, um, you know, governments and politicians are doing crazy stuff that maybe impacts the internet. Having an understanding of, of what's actually going on will make you a more informed citizen as these things are going on around you. So the more you can play, the better, honestly. But. Yeah. So we're out of time, but thank you very much, Jessica, for a great talk. Thank you for coming. Yeah.